Hi, everyone. My name is Sayed Khorshahi, and I will be your host for this session. I had the medical device segment of the Regulatory Compliance Associates, and RCA is a life science consulting company and a subdivision of Nelson Laboratories. I worked in the medical device industry since the late 80s. I worked at Beckman Coulter for 11 years, at Baxter Healthcare for nine, and Covidian uh, and Medtronic uh, for four years before joining RCA seven years ago. I share the stage with James Pink for this session. Uh, James is a senior director medical at Element Materials Technologies. He has more than 25 years of experience in medical technology, product safety, quality, and regulation. He's an active participant in future medical technology regulation and standards. Uh, and he has significant experience of EU regulations, the operations of the notified bodies and product liability in the field of medical devices. Uh, today's session is about the CDRH's quality management program and what they do to meet their customer needs and protect public health. CDRH has over 1,700 professionals, which are scientists, engineers, clinicians, uh, statisticians, and they're structured in six different offices. And their QMP um, program is uh, ISO 9001 compliant and is utilized to improve the consistency of the services they provide to continually improve the quality of products and services of medical uh, device industry. With that, I'm going to turn it over to James. James, it's all yours. Hi, Syed. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, well, I think um, first things first, can you see the screen? That's probably one of the... Um the most important features um, of the presentation. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was a, a very interesting topic because what we're looking at is an agency uh, representing the United States of America's patient uh, uh, safety program in terms of medical technologies, um, as well as other radiological health based products. Um, and as you said, we have 1700 individuals whom are working in a system to you know, obviously um, protect and improve the human health of uh, the United States nations. And of course, that um, is both a domestic and an international stage. Now, ultimately, when we started to think about this program, the first thing is that the FDA have actually defined uh, ultimately the quality management system requirements that they have uh, in place and meet in order to be able to uh, drive continuous improvement in the areas um, where they serve. So whether that be um, identifying the products that need to be uh, brought into the market to assist uh, the demands of the healthcare systems and various programs around innovation and fast tracking and, 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 and enabling uh, speedy reviews of certain technologies, as we've seen in COVID, for example, as well under emergency use authorization or whether it's identifying signals and detecting uh, potential trends and vulnerabilities where um, medical devices may present a, a risk and exactly what processes are in place uh, to manage that. Um, and so we started to have a look at ISO 9001 a little bit in terms of, you know, what exactly is, um, you know, what, it, what, what exactly is uh, required in in a quality management system of a regulator. Um, and, and we started to, you know, I, I wanted to sort of compare and contrast, you know, be a little bit more present at this moment in time and compare the United States sort of regulatory system uh, under the CDRH uh, with that of what we're now seeing with Europe and the uh, designation of European notified bodies, uh, in particular with the uh, specific designation and quality requirements uh, that are uh, imposed through Annex 7 of the new European medical device regulations and, of course, the European 
uh, in vitro diagnostic regulations. And what we could see is that in terms of the quality systems, um, the FDA has made a full commitment, commitment uh, to comply with ISO 9001, which is an international uh, quality management system standard um, that has been subjected to significant review over the last 20, 25 years. You know, we remember, I remember uh, when ISO 9001 2000 was launched and uh, ultimately looking at the process approach and to its um, it, it, its level now at 2020, where we can see a whole change in uh, what they call the SL version of a standard, which is ultimately looking at how an organization uh, looks at its external environment, its internal environment, at its strategic drivers, at its customer and stakeholder drivers, and how through processes and resources, uh, it delivers to those needs. And of, as, as, as we've mentioned already, how it then evaluates its performance so that it can begin to continually improve. And that would extend out to how it manages sort of 510k pre-market notifications, uh, how it deals with establishment registrations, how it sort of ultimately um, oversees the inspection program um, in terms of um, the routine and for cause uh, inspections. And of course, how it actually does the role of enforcement from uh, generating evidence to uh, and you know ultimately uh, enforce all the way through to you know enabling access of those critical technologies and it was quite interesting to compare and contrast say the uh, the, the the agency's quality program and standards versus that of what we're seeing within the European Union particularly when uh, you 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 start of um, you, you you look at uh, where the strategic priorities are going. And there's a, a great document uh, that's available here uh, from the FDA that outlines what those strategic priorities are uh, of the agency. And as you've mentioned already, uh, it details the actual uh, uh, elements of ISO 9001 as a uh, quality system that uh, would would be required, you know, and would be uh, would be applied. Now, in terms of the strategic plan, we can see a number of commitments uh, that are being made, uh, such as promoting a modern and diverse workforce, enhanced organizational agility and resilience, advanced health equity. So really looking at those programs where there is a demographic, it might be racial bias, it may be uh, that there is a socioeconomic bias in the delivery of health outcomes and, of course, how the FDA and CDRH prioritizes technologies, how it enables digital health technologies in order to be able to understand those diverse populations and put patients first uh, within the, uh, the, the, the process of en enabling medical technologies to come to market and stay on that market in a way that is uh, protecting and improving uh, the health of the US nation. And we can see that within the strategic plan are a number of measures of success. So an ISO 9001 organization has to understand its customers, its its external environment, and obviously the external environment that uh, that, it, that is, uh, I guess, shaping uh, the agency's views on this is is the ultimate goal of improving uh, the quality of life years for a, a a nation, you know, and ultimately, in order to be able to do that, we have to be engaged with patients, we have to be engaged with healthcare providers, we have to be engaged with um, the, the 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 general public, and we also have to be engaged with the agency, and of course, with manufacturers, um, in order to be able to um, ultimately uh, deliver on those uh, strategic objectives. And you can see that when you are establishing objectives, you, they need to be smart, they need to be measurable, they need to be achievable, uh, they need to be result and target orientated. And as you can see already, you know, that there are some pretty uh, important stretch targets that the FDA has put out, you know, in terms of 50% of manufacturers of newly authorized novel technologies 
will be brought into the US market first or in parallel with other mar major markets. That has a profound impact on where the US FDA CDRH places itself as a enabler uh, for novel technologies. And of course, what programs uh, from pre-market authorization, investigational device exemption, fast track processes, if, if, if you wish as well, uh, to the, the sort of the traditional pre-market notification activities that may enable that. And of course, we can see how, you know, a, a, an objective um, that is measurable and of course uh, looks achievable is, is, is then delivered through the agency. We can also see that by December 31st, more than 75% of the time, um, FDA identifies and acts on significant safety signals uh, and, and other major markets will be, uh, will be initiated. So again, really giving some very clear signs of what the expectations are uh, in terms of the time and resources um, are focusing on those signals and signal detection that will enable the agency to respond uh, to uh, those pervasive and uh, emerging risks that, again, are affecting the quality of life years of the population. So we can see a number of strategies and actions and measures of success, uh, which is largely in line with uh, those requirements in ISO 9001. Uh, if we are trying to establish those requirements, it's OK, I'm just trying to uh, uh, progress through. Uh, there we go. Uh, we can look at the structure of ISO 9001. And what you can see here is a, a direct figure from uh, the standard uh, with a number of, uh, if you wish, bubbles, uh, which are in the context of a quality management system. And you can see the gray arrows coming in from the left hand side, which is basically saying, look, what is the FDA? What is the CDRH? What is the organization in its context? What are the customer requirements? So we have requirements from the 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 the, the, the payers. We have the requirements from the um, uh, from, from from the population. We have requirements coming in from manufacturers and and all entities that wish to have devices placed in the market. So the healthcare providers themselves, and then we also have interested parties that have needs and expectations that will be of relevant interest to the agency and. What we look then is that the agency are, are clearly setting out through the strategic priorities, the, 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 the planning and leadership requirements. And what we can also see is that through um, um, what, what we could say enablers um, of, around the customer service requirements, the performance metrics, the data issued from the medical device user, -free, uh, user fee schemes, um, enables us to have not only objectives and the necessary strategy, but also the processes that will support and operate uh, the delivery of those activities and ultimately leading to the performance evaluation, as you can see here on the right hand side of the bubbles, that ultimately drive the results and the subsequent uh, improvements uh, necessary to meet those defined uh, performance indicators. And what's interesting is that we can see those drivers um, aggregated within the strategic priorities, but we can also see that there are various standards of excellence that are demanded of the agency staff as well. So again, we can, we can look at the uh, various uh, standards that are expected. So be respectful, be responsive, open-minded, communicate effectively be proactive and collaborative. So we can see that this is disseminating down into all agency actors and ultimately enabling an organization to both a diverse organization to be fit and able to be able to deliver those demands set out here within the strategic plan. So already um, as an ex auditor of ISO 9000 systems, I can begin to see that the, the agency is shaping the direction, listening to uh, those third parties, understanding where the organization sits and establishing the context of the organization and its purpose, and ultimately driving through programs 
where there is a concentrated effort of delivering uh, to the needs and demands of those external parties. We can also see that there are various uh, feedback systems in place uh, from a performance perspective, looking at the satisfaction or service ratings, which if you look back into uh, 2014, we're at an all time low of 83%. And, and as we can see, sort of driving those satisfaction or service scores, if you wish, not necessarily just satisfaction, but service itself, up to a level now as last published in 2021 at, at 92%. So ultimately, a, a, a sort of a very generic measure, but a measure indeed of the way that the CDRH is set up in terms of its delivery uh, to uh, the various entities necessary to fulfil those objectives. We can also see through the CDRH's patient and science and engagement programmes that there are um, mechanisms in place to be able to connect to the wider system. So we're not just looking at the healthcare provider that is using the medical device where the manufacturer is, uh, is placing and, 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 and retaining that in the, in, within the market. But we're also looking at that, those end users, those patient engagement um, um, forum that are then enabling, enabling the agency to set out that strategy and, and ensure that uh, we have an agency that is uh, fit for the future. And we can also see that through the metrics um, and performance reports associated with the uh, 510K program, if we remember, you know, one of the things that uh, we want to be able to see is that uh, that these novel new technologies are coming into the market in the US and, and are actually um, first to the market within the US. Therefore, we need to be able to see that the performance of um, mechanisms such as the pre-market notification process are delivering within the necessary expectations um, around uh, review times, uh, as you can see, final decision-making processes and the the, the, the support and operational processes that are necessary to be able to ensure that the uh, impedance to a FDA final decision is not an impedance that is caused because of the lack of competency, capacity, capability of the agency, but are more upon the gift of the organisation submitting to present uh, the evidence necessary to um, deliver uh, the, 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 the safe and effective device. And one of the things, Said, that I was quite interested in is then comparing and contrasting this sort of agency ISO 9001 approach uh, to that of the European Union and really trying to sort of think about, you know, what, what do we have in Europe? You know, if, if we've got ISO 9001, it's demanding a knowledge of the external environment it's demanding a knowledge of customer requirements. It's demanding the agency to have a quality management system that is planning, leading, supporting, evaluating, and then improving its services in order to be able to achieve results that do drive that customer satisfaction, do drive that reduction in risk to uh, human health. Um, and then I sort of started to look at that from Europe and thought, well, to be brutally honest and critical, you know, the, 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 the quality management system requirements necessary for notified bodies is a compliance-based system. It's almost going back to the late 90s where you have a procedure, you say what you do, you do what you say, and hell, you're compliant. And that's quite a interesting dichotomy between the two regulatory systems at the moment. We have an agency you know, that I'm sure it has many faults, but it has many positives. We have a, a European framework that has many faults and many positives. But the realities are that the baseline quality management system drivers um, seem to be uh, in conflict with each other. We have a, a dynamic, you know, present best state of the art approach to management systems in ISO 9001. And then we have a 
sort of drop back two decades uh, in in terms of you know let's let's compliance culture let's look at have you got a management documentation we've got policies and objectives have you got policies for assignment of personnel controller documents kappa you know um and, and and continuous training i thought at one stage it might say continuous improvement it doesn't um so we're lacking in in a, a sort of a european capacity uh around those stakeholder engagement customer satisfaction performance evaluation improvement and one could argue and it would be rather naive that you know oh well customers you know the customers of a of, of a of a conformity assessment to the of the manufacturers you know we don't want to be satisfying the manufacturers we want to be satisfying the overall market well of course if we look at iso 9001 you can see that it's not that the customer is much broader than the payer or the the commissioner you know the customer is that patient the customer is that quality of life years at the end of the whole uh, purpose of protecting and improving human health you know it, it's it's the receiver of the the technologies that are now going to address some of the greatest problems in healthcare such as growing waiting lists you know an ill health service rather than a preventive health service and ultimately the tools and technologies that will enable that under a regulatory system with personnel operating uh, processes that are designed to deliver those very high level strategic uh, requirements so I'll, I'll stop the, the the presentation now and um uh, well yeah i will stop the presentation now said and i'd be more than happy to uh, engage in any further questions that you have my friend and uh, you know we I, I, I guess we can spend the next few minutes really talking about that and i think uh, dennis baker has got a question as well yeah okay so her question is um is it only cdrh who have accepted iso 9001 or other part of fda using this as standard for quality system that's a great question. It's interesting because the way FDA has framed it is that they're fully compliant, but um, they didn't say they're certified ISO 9001. They said they're fully compliant with ISO 9001. And when I did the search on the uh, International Accreditation um, Forum website, uh, there is no division of FDA that has a certificate for ISO 9001. Um, so I don't know uh, what your thought process is, James, in terms of whether the other divisions, I'm not aware of the other divisions uh, having this. I'm sure they have a quality management program because at the end of the day, as you said, this is all about uh, the customers and the customers of FDA. It, it, you know, FDA is all about protecting public health and it's all about the patients and then what they do, uh, et cetera. So uh, what are your thoughts uh, about Denise's question? Yeah, I, I, I think again, you know, the, the I, I can't see um, any reference with CDER or CBER um, implementing this um, quality management system. I can't see anything from the agri products or the food safety side. That's not to say that they haven't, I just cannot and, and did not find any references to some of the other agencies um, even going outside cdrh to sort of the office of device evaluation and and into some of the sort of more more local um, and regional branches of the fda there's no absolute discussion about that i think um again a certification to iso 9001 would have uncovered the scope of activities uh, that would have then helped us understand a little bit more about exactly how far in the implementation of 9001 this goes across agency um but i you know I, I think to answer that question um other parts of the fda using this standard i i would have to revert to um giving me a little bit more time to find out but uh, it's probably a good idea if you're in part of the you know if you're interested in part of the um different units then perhaps we can ask the question you know i, th I think that that's uh, the, the best answer i can give right at this moment in time uh, Said and, and denny's yeah 
So I, I think you talked a little bit about, you know, at the end of the day, the customers, because FDA's customers um, are, at, you know, the most important is the, uh, the patient. So we'll talk a little bit about the patient and then the patient engagement program, et cetera. But um, also it's about uh, the satisfaction of the services that FDA provides because FDA provides those services for the manufacturers of medical devices and the services that they provide. And they do have their uh, qual you know, quarterly uh, um, metrics that they collect through uh, the surveys, et cetera. So let's touch a little bit upon that. And then, you know, because when you look at those metrics, it sounds like they consistently are in the, you know, 80 plus percent um, satisfaction with their clients and what they're doing to improve their processes. Uh, and then we'll talk, you know, a little bit more about the, uh, the patient engagement program, et cetera. Yeah, I, I think the context of the organization is really important because, again, from an ISO 9001 perspective, you are you really are looking at what what can I impact? You know, you, you've got your paying customer, if you wish, um, which can be sort of related back to a, a sort of a taxpayer. This is federal. So, you know, that, you know, taxes are at some point going into this part, but also you can make a determination that there are medical device user fees. So there are manufacturers that if you want, you know, in the traditional sense, show me the money is ultimately driven from, you know, exactly where that funding comes. But you can see already within the agency that programs such as uh, the patient engagement strategies, the um, innovation activities and how to support that innovation is clearly showing that the agency understands that its customer is not restricted to its funding or commissioner, if you wish. And, and that far out stretches, you know, the uh, the, 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 the scope of, of, of the customer. But you also have to be you have to be incredibly realistic as an entity, as an organization and understand exactly how can you impact, you know, that mission of improving and protecting human health. You know, how does that happen? Uh, and from an agency perspective, and whilst, you know, we, we, we could say something like, well, you know, we're going to we, we're, we're going to tackle the problem of digital health and digital therapeutics. And that's going to reduce a waiting list in cardiovascular or in orthopedics. Or we're going to tackle the the sort of the mental health crisis that we've got within certain as we would as, as the FDA put in its strategic plan equity. So we might be looking at certain regions, certain demographics, certain socioeconomic circumstances or just certain populations that are more at risk. And, you know, when when it comes back to, OK, well, how are you going to impact this? How are you going to improve the quality of life years? The agency only has so many levers. You know, ultimately, it is there to enable access for medical technologies. So it, it's really about, OK, well, how do I how do I smooth out that? you know, that, that access and how do I ensure that there's an adequate balance between benefit and risk in the sense of, hell, if we, you know, at the end of the day, it, it could be in everyone's gift to say, well, let's not just have, let's not have regulation, you know, uh, there you go, everything on the market. And, and ultimately you've solved one problem in the enabling side, but you've probably caused a myriad of problems in, in the sense of we've now proliferated the entire market. We've got technologies that people... Uh, uh, don't know how to use or are misusing or, or, or misinterpreting the use. And therefore, the, the overall impact on quality of life years begins to reduce. So that context of the organization is very, very important. And I think with the strategic priorities, you can see there's a very firm understanding of the context of how the FDA CDRH can deliver on, on, on a program. Now, is it perfect? No, no. I'm sure there's many people. You're a U.S. citizen. You could, you know, you, 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 you could comment on that and probably tell the cows come home. But the, the realities are that we, we have to say, are, are the support activities, processes and strategic priorities that have been set by the agency and in particular the CDRH, are they broadly in line with, you know, it, the ability of it to be able to succeed? 
I mean, you in, in, in our discussions yesterday, you, you were speaking about smart objectives. You know, the, the smart objectives are not just some management rubbish that have come out of an MBA course. It's it, it's actually, look, are they smart because we can do something with this? You know, can we actually affect this? If I'm a reviewer, if I'm an inspector, if I'm a, a, a national expert, can I add, can I, can I do something that can enable this strategy to actually be delivered and, and, and look at the performance? And as you said, with the customer satisfaction ratings, that's one small component of the bigger picture in terms of performance. So it's, it's quite interesting to see how customer satisfaction um, performance would be judged in engagement, for example, because it's not been paid for. You know, the, 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 the agency has to go out and engage. It, it doesn't say, um, you know, so somebody who is dealing with, I don't know, some implant group or patient group who's, 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 who's had various types of implants, they, 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 they're not paying to engage with the CDRH. Therefore, you might not be getting any data from those groups. Uh, so, so therefore, it's, it, it's more about, OK, how do you get the right information to inform whether you're having impact in the areas where you said you want uh, strategic importance. And I think that, that the 2022-2025 strategic plan does have results or performance-related measures that you can be judged against, you can measure, you know, you can evaluate. Um, I don't know whether they're absolutely phenomenally great, say, but, you know, it's, it, it's better than nothing, isn't it? I think that that's the the reality and um, yeah yeah well let's talk a little bit about some of the um differences between fda and the eu i remember back <clears throat> a few years back when we needed to get product out the door we wanted to go to europe because it was much easier to get <laughs> under the mdd under the directive to get products out the door versus fda and with coming up with MDR, that now is no longer a directive, it's no longer an option or something voluntary for each one of the member countries. And that whole structure of having the EU Parliament, the Commission, the, the, uh, uh, the competent authorities, the notified bodies under them, and the fact that the manufacturers can change notified bodies and all of that structure, I think they have made good strides from that perspective, but now um, it has changed a little bit. It's There are a lot of companies that would want to come to U.S. first versus to Europe. And then, you know, uh, contrasting in terms of, you know, at the end of the day, this is all about the uh, protection of public health and improvement and bringing innovation, bringing better uh, basically outcome for these diseases, et cetera. So uh, just in, in general, how do you see that? And then what's the role of having a quality system to help you get there in terms of uh, not only customer satisfaction, but also better outcome for the patients? I think I, I think it, it, it all boils down to approach, really. Um, let, let's, let, 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 let's not be under any illusion that the regulatory system within Europe um, had clearly failed in many areas, you know, be it whether it was through notified body consistency and oversight, whether it was through enabling technologies that were more novel or less understood uh, to come to market in a in, in a way that there were no guardrails in the evidence generation process and subsequently then in the signal detection process. Let's not be under any illusion that you know if you look at the fda system you have very advanced databases you may all look at that and think well they're, they're bloody antiquated and you know they're not they're not the most advanced things but at least we had a database of knowing what manufacturer makes what product to which standard and how that product's performing by linking it to a total product life cycle you know and and that 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 in itself is magic in terms of a a, a you know, one of the world's largest, if not the world's largest health economies in the US, being able to understand what's in there in the market and also be able to align signal detection in order to be able to prioritize pre-market notification, enforcement action and inspections. And of course, 
we know that the European regulatory framework was somewhat um, less organized, both from a regulatory, you know, a black and white law perspective, and then the actual institutional actors and databases, you know, with the European database on medical devices, Udebed, they, they, they didn't exist, you know, they were spreadsheets and they were sort of individual competent authority sort of uh, solutions. So they come from different levels, but now, you know, with Europe, you look at it and you think, who the hell decided that it was a great idea to change a regulation, change the people who regulate the regulation, change the people who appoint and designate the regulators of the regulation and change the internal external regulatory environment on how we do it at the same time. You know, that it's, it's, it's a very interesting um, case study for anyone in European or international law to see whether or not this was the most uh, appropriate way of doing it. And, and only time will tell, by the way, only time will tell. But if we all sit there with the prime objective of, helping to improve and protect patient health. That's the, the the absolute cornerstone of what the FDA, CDRH is doing and what European competent authorities and the European Commission and Medical Device Coordinating Group and Notify Bodies and, and so on and so forth. I don't think there's any individual that is part of those organisations that does not have that in in. That, that, that moral compass and ethical compass around protecting a patient. You know, the, 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 I don't think there's anyone in, in this industry. But the problem is, is now that we've got a, a, a sort of an argument on principles. We've got a more precautionary system in Europe and a very proportionate system in America. Um, but importantly, it's proportionate, but very precautionate in America, which is weird. It's sort of like, what do you mean, James? Well, it, the realities are is it's very proportionate because we know what to regulate and why. And then in the precautionary side, it is incredibly clear what the swim lanes and guidelines are in terms of how you get devices into this market. So it becomes more predictable. Now, under the current European framework, there's still a lot of unknown unknowns that nobody can answer. You know, there are common specifications not written, delegating acts, implementing acts not, not established. Um, standards that may be at different stages of, of their maturity and then actors like notified bodies who are still trying to understand what is required but still only listening perhaps to maybe one member state's competent authority so we've got a little bit of a I think it's more of a configuration system at the moment everyone's trying to become aware of what the system is um, and, I, and I think that 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 dichotomy requires things like quality management systems, because if you imagine you've got a com you, you've got an organization that is a bit choppy out there in terms of the market, it's a bit, you know, difficult to understand exactly what we should be doing, how we should be doing it. You can always revert to typing solid processes that are very agile, that are continuously learning and adapting and then ensuring that the end game is still being protected is, is still being achieved which of course both markets is is to protect and improve human health how by providing access to the technologies that are most needed and most impactful but maintaining a knowledge of the technologies that present the highest risk to the patient populations and and controlling them in a way that you know only the the, the ones that are safe and work remain on the market yeah it, it, it's it's interesting. I think the EU MDR versus MDD has brought a lot of good things. It's just the deployment and how that's happening. Uh, there there are a lot of issues and problems that we're facing just because of the amount of change, etc. Uh, one of the things that they basically brought in was this less emphasis on equivalence. Now, if we look at you know FDA's ISO 9001 and trying to listen to you know it, it's like if you look at the substantial equivalence program in FDA, uh, we could have products that cleared many years ago and now have been discontinued. You still can use those <laughs> as substantial equivalent and get clearance on your new devices. And this is not something that FDA hasn't known about it, but it's interesting that EU has responded to that and has done things to, um, to basically address it versus FDA. 
but but I think um, also when we're talking about process improvement, continuous improvements, et cetera, uh, one of the issues that we have had for such a long time, and FDA has been uh, definitely bringing it up, is this whole concept of the move to ISO 1345 in terms of, you know, 820 versus ISO 1345, probably there's a good amount of, I'm actually surprised that, you know, when you look at the, um, the FDA, um, you know, device regulations, uh, that design controls came in back in uh, the late 90s, 96, you know, they, it came into effect in 97. A lot of those things are still actually <laughs> make sense, you know, even though many years have passed by, et cetera. Uh, but, but the fact that some of the terminologies are different, some of the things are different and FDA is moving towards that uh, with their announcement not that long ago, I think those are all good news that now the companies don't need to have two separate, you know, terminologies and then keep up with both the 820 and ISO 1345. So, uh, so those are some of the things that I, I think is going to help. Uh, hopefully in the future, that is going to also come into play in terms of a common way of submissions and a common way of assessing the submissions, etc. And I just wanted you to shed some lights on those uh, areas also. Well, I think I think that the FDA's um, acknowledgement, and don't forget how how much effort and participation the FDA played in the formation of the medical device single audit program, for example. If you think about that motivation to try and reduce the burden on manufacturers, has synthesised the drive towards trying to ensure, not necessarily through regulation, but actually through inspection, that you know, the, 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 the guys who are running up and down the country are coming out from domestic to international inspections, understand that there are complete alignment with CFR 21820 and 13485. And, you know, ensuring that the agency is focused on that translational work of not being a, you know, an agency that is just purely their regulation, our own regulation, US regulation, you know, but acknowledging that there's a greater market out there there are dr greater drivers uh, there are organizations at different technology readiness levels and at different commercialization levels that may have come from grounds that are not necessarily as familiar in cfr 21820 but i've actually been quite happy applying iso 13485 in jurisdictions outside of the us and i kind of think it aligns to the strategic priorities is that we don't want to be in a situation where and it, it's still a bit problematic, the, the situation of someone weighing up whether it's which one's the tougher regulation, the FDA or Europe, or which one's the better GMP, 820 or 13485. And I don't think anyone's got that motivation anymore. I think what we want to do is we say, OK, we want to make a safe product. What are, what are the principles of a safe product? You know, um, knowing requirements, knowing risks, having a design control process that keeps you focused and demonstrates an evidence base as you move through the uh, through the product development process and product realization process is a good thing you know it is and 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 recognizing and working hard to find where there is a single source of truth and one common principle is much better than running away trying to develop more and more regulation uh, as soon as there's a knee jerk reaction from a a population and i think you know, the FDA has been world leaders in that. I would like to say that uh, so has the European Union and 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 and, and now post Brexit UK. There, there are, and, and I'm doing a disservice to many other jurisdictions like Canada, Australia, Brazil, Japan, and and and, and many many more that have participated in trying to get that international uh, collaboration. But ultimately, you know, to to put my slide on the on the question, I think. You know, it's very clear that the agency understands its external environment and drivers, because why would you want to even talk about the potential adaptation or, act, 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 you know, consideration of 13485 above and beyond a well-defined, well-implemented, you know, legislated uh, code of federal regulation? All right. I think we're coming up on time. Well, James, thank you very much for an informative uh, presentation and a lively discussion. 
Thank you. And uh, and thank you very much.